they come, let's stand. That would be put the two feet on the ground and get the butt off them. You can stay seated or stand as you feel that. It's no big deal.
church and people who pray in the casino. <laughs> What's the difference between people who pray in church and the people who pray in casino? Do you have the answer? The people, yeah, that's true too. But the people in the casino really mean it. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. We're going to talk about gambling this morning. <clears throat> it's the third in a series of sermons called the Stumbling Block Issues. <clears throat> And those of you who remember every word I say from the pulpit will remember that 18 months ago, I preached on gambling. But, and I even started with a similar story that I'm going to start with today. But that message went this way, and this one's going this way. So, <clears throat> most, most times people remember my stories more than they remember my sermons. So you probably will remember the story. But anyway, I was raised in a King James home. That means that I had a very conservative upbringing. My mother was very conservative, underlined the word very, conservative. <clears throat> and one of the many things that were pounded into our heads is you don't gamble. You don't gamble. You don't do that. And so I went all the way through my grade school, middle school, high school, and into college, and I never gambled. And then um, I started playing ping pong when I was 14, and I became pretty good at it. In fact, some would say I was very good at it. And I got into college, I started playing ping pong with people, and uh, I discovered that I could take money away from people by simply saying, hey, I'll play you, I'll give you five points, I'll give you 10 points, I'll give you 15 points, and then play them for a dollar or two or five. And, um, and that, on the surface, that sounds like gambling, but I assure you it was not. I never lost. So <laughs> I never lost. I never bet against somebody, I never put points on the table that I knew I couldn't overcome, and I never bet somebody I knew I couldn't beat. Okay, so I've never lost a ping pong to gambling ever in my life. So that's not gambling. So I, I went to college, finished college, went to the service, came back, started to work for Dad. My dad had a printing company, and he did a lot of work for uh, China Glass and Pottery Table, what we call the tabletop industry. And in the 70s and the 80s and into the 90s, the tabletop industry had an annual trade show in Atlantic City, New Jersey. If, and that's where they introduced their new lines. That's where they wanted their promotional literature and price lists to be available. Um, believe me, if you want to have a wonderful place to be on the second January in, in January, second Sunday of January, there is no place more fun than Atlantic City, New Jersey. It is bitter cold. Mm -hmm. It almost, almost is always snowing. The wind is always blowing. It's nasty. And all the hotels are designed for summer. So the windows are like, Ooh. anyway. So my father and the printing company, we printed materials for these glass companies. And those printed materials needed to be at the glass show at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning of the second Sunday of January. Glass companies being who they are, marketing guys being who they are, decisions weren't made until the last minute. Pictures weren't taken until the last minute. Printing didn't get done. I would leave Ohio 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight on Saturday night drive nine and a half hours to Atlantic City all night. It happened for 12 years in a row I did that. Well, one particular Saturday, we're loading the truck, I'm frantically trying to get out of there, and one of the people that works for my dad is the son of a local dentist, very well off, and this gentleman said to me, what gaming, what, what do you like to gamble on when you go to Atlantic City? And I said, oh man, I don't gamble. He said, Gam you don't gamble? I said, no, I've never gambled in my entire life. He couldn't believe it. I was like, you have never gambled. Nope. I said, money's too hard to come by, too easy to lose. I'm not gambling. And he pulls out a $50 bill out of his wallet, and he says, here, place this on one number on the roulette wheel so you can have the thrill of gambling one time in your life. 
I'm like, oh, dude, I'm not going to do that. I argued with him. He insisted. He stuffed the fifty dollar in my pocket. So I loaded the truck, started driving to New Jersey, thinking I'm going to have a really good dinner when I get done with this. And I'm going to come back home. I'm going to tell him this long, complicated story about oh, I gambled and I was five thousand dollars ahead, and then I, you know, I'm going to make up this whole big story, which is all going to be a lie, right? Well, when it comes time to finally. I, I deliver everything, I go get some sleep, I go have a bite to eat, and I'm thinking, I, I can't do that. I can't lie to this guy. My mother's in the back of my head going, you can't lie. <laughs> so I go to the roulette wheel, and I say to the roulette dealer, I said, I've never done this before. Would you explain the game to me? He said, oh, sure. So I started playing a dollar here and a dollar there. I played for about, I think about three hours, and I was $100. That $50 became $100. And I took the black chip and I put it in my pocket and I said, I am taking that home, all right? When the guy says to me, did you have fun? I'm going to say, yeah, flicking, you know, wouldn't that be cool? And so Sunday ended, Monday ended, Tuesday ended. By Tuesday, I'm thinking, it would be twice as much fun to show two black $100 chips, right? So I go back to the table, so you want to finish the story for me? I lost that $100 and 35 more of my own. <laughs> And the moral of the story is, if you're ever in a casino and you get ahead, walk out. But most people don't do that. That's my experience with gambling. And that's how I got interested in that. <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> gambling is a stumbling block issue because it is so deeply saturated into our culture. We don't even know it's that. We don't, it doesn't even raise any... Um, awareness, you know. Um, for instance, Shelbyville Casino just underwent a big change. How many of you are aware of the big change that went under? Okay, what happened, Hannah? They got live table. They got live table games. Now, if you're playing on a machine, gamblers in their head think the machine is rigged. I don't have a chance. But on table games, they think I can beat the system. It's random. See, the dice are rolling. There's no control. And, and gamblers love table games. The casino down here at Shelbyville is booming because of table games. Well, what do the following things have in common? Fan duel, Texas Hold'em, lottery tickets, roulette, raffles, 50-50 drawings, slot machines, pole tabs, church bingo, draft kings. What do they all have in common? They take your money. They're all forms of gambling. Gambling is in every corner of our lives. You cannot watch a sports event on television or on the internet without some ad for gambling popping up. <clears throat> Would someone like to offer me a definition of gambling? What's the dictionary definition for gambling? Anybody? No gamblers in the house. Risks without guarantees, probably. <laughs> Gambling by definition is, do I have a slide? Gambling by definition is to play games of chance for money. We play the game to win money. That's what gambling is, right? To take a risky action in the hope of getting a desired result, gamble to raise money. Have you ever wondered why people gamble? Last summer there was a casino in Las Vegas who wanted to know the answer to that very question. So they asked 5,500 people who came through the door, why do you gamble? And we're gonna play a real quick version of Family Feud here without the families, right? <clears throat> now, I'm gonna give you a hint. The number one most popular answer is not what you're thinking, okay? Number one answer, survey says, the reason they gamble is? Entertainment. Entertainment, it's fun, you know? Life is so boring, we have to go to the Keys Casino and spend our, our week's salary for entertainment. All right? Number two reason is the one you've been thinking all along. Number two reason for gambling is? Money. 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 All right. This one, the next two surprised me. Number three, why do you gamble? Boredom. Well, apparently, when you go to the roulette wheel or the, or the poker table or the craps table, you develop an instantaneous relationship with the other people around the table. 
So the number three reason for going to the casinos is social interaction. Can't make friends anywhere else. I can only make friends with people who are losing money right alongside of me. All right. Uh, you'll laugh at the next one. Number four reason for gambling or going to the casino. This is a true answer. Go ahead. <laughs> That's what they said. I'm not making that up. That was the number four most popular answer of 5,500 people at that casino. Number five. <clears throat> if you've ever, I'll, I'll just use roulette as an example. If you've ever put $10 or $20 or $30 on one number and watch that ball go around, man, when it starts bouncing near your number, it's like, whoa. <clears throat> so I've been told. <clears throat> There's quite an adrenaline rush. Number six. I didn't know this. You can get free things from the casino. Did you know that? And number seven, to make games on television more interesting to watch. Now, I have a very interesting question, and I want you to think about this, and then we're going to take a vote. All right? Now, here's the question. If I am gambling with money I can afford to lose, is it gambling, or is it just entertainment? All right? Now, think about that for a minute. If I am betting money that I can afford to lose, am I really gambling? <clears throat> Last year, uh, Pam and I went to see Taylor and Allie and some others play basketball. And when we got to the gym, they asked for $5 for Pam and $5 for me. And we paid that $5, not because we thought that, that Allie was going to give it back to us or that we were going to win money at the end of the night. We paid that $5 for entertainment. entertainment. We said goodbye to it. So okay, we're going to pay $10 and we're going to have a couple of hours of entertainment, right? No. What if we look at gambling that way? Is that really gambling or is that just paying for entertainment? All right, so we're going to take a vote now. Raise of hands, all who think it is not gambling if it, you can afford to lose the money and you're just using it as a form of entertainment. It's not gambling, it's just entertainment. Okay, all right? Opposite view, it is gambling. All right, thank you very much. Wasn't a wrong answer. There's not a right answer. There's just your answer. Since it's church and it's Sunday morning, we should probably see what the Bible has to say about the subject of gambling. How many times does the word gamble appear in the, in the Bible? Anyone? How many times does gambling or any synonym for gambling? The answer is zero. <laughs> the Bible does not address gambling, period. So... By that, we can assume it's okay, right? Well, yes and no. We have to see what the Bible has to say about this whole subject of money. And I'm going to suggest to you, well, let's read Timothy first. This is a very, very familiar passage. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Now you've heard that many times, not in that full version, but you've heard it, right? I wonder, does gambling have anything to do with the love of money? Now, <laughs> uh, here's another passage from Hebrews that says the same basic thing, but it's not nearly as familiar. Keep your heart free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So there's a, that actually points to the heart of the matter. Keep your, your life free from the love of money and remember, God said, I will never leave you. The, the point of the story, the point of the message is, I believe that gambling, the heart of gambling is a desire to be happy. The underlying reason behind the seven reasons given up there, other than learning to be better math, is, I think, a desire to be happy. And I think our society has sold us one answer, and I think Scripture teaches us a different answer. I think our society has given us a misguided answer to the question, if you want to be happy, you need money. And if you want to be really happy, you need money. Lots of money. Ask Megan and Harry if lots of money makes you happy. More money. What's a good, easy, quick, safe, 
way to make a lot of money. Tomorrow, let's all go buy a lottery ticket. Lottery ticket. It's only a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, two dollars, I think. <coughs> right? What's two dollars? And there's a chance we could win two hundred and fifty million dollars. Wow! Who has not bought a lot of ticket, a lottery ticket, and thought about what would two hundred million dollars after taxes do to your life? Huh? Am I the only one that's ever done that? And I want you to know, I'm perfectly content with my, with my financial position and my salary. But isn't it fun to buy a ticket and just think about it? I mean, wow, because money will make you happy, right? And I offer myself as an example of how deeply rooted the culture plants into your soul this idea that money will make you happy. I know better. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I know better. And yet, when, when that lottery gets to a quarter of a billion dollars, I'm thinking, all right, what's two dollars, you know? Roll the dice. Do I walk out on the golf course going, boy, I hope I get struck by lightning today. <laughs> my chances of being struck by lightning on the golf course twice in my life are better than me winning the lottery. Do you know that? And yet, we play the lottery. We spend money on sports games. We go to the casino. Because money will make you happy. Jesus had something to say about that in Matthew chapter 6. He said, No one can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. In a modern sense of the word, you cannot chase God and money. They are mutually exclusive goals with one person's life. You cannot make one the goal of your life and the other. It doesn't work that way. Here's an interesting statistic that I find it interesting anyway. The average, let's try that again. For the average household for a family of four, the average household income for a family of four is $65,000. Okay? And 75% of all families in America make $75,000 or less. Three-fourths of all the people in America make less than $75,000. If you ask people on the street, what is the definition of rich, or what would make you feel rich, you know what the answer is? The answer across the board is $75,000. Between seventy-five and 80000 In point of fact, most of the people in America will say $75,000 a year makes you rich. And they don't want to be richer than that. That's, this is fascinating me. That same survey asked, what would, would you like to be rich? And the overwhelming answer was no. People want to be comfortable and they want to be secure, but they don't want to be rich. Why do you suppose people don't want to be rich? More money, more problems. Huh? More money, more problems. There's problems. Look at the wealthy people around us. Look at, uh, in the news. Yeah, How many so stories of happy, rich people do you come across? Most of those stories are screwed up. How many children of millionaires have died on overdoses or high-speed car traces or, or uh, airplane accidents? We don't want to be rich. We want to be happy and secure and content. So a little bit of money is great. Now, those of us who are Christians, we have a different passage of Scripture that we need to pay attention to, and that's 1 Corinthians 6.20. It says... For you have been bought with a price. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Meaning, use your body, use your life to glorify God. <clears throat> Here's the one thing I hope you remember today. Okay? Uh, what's at the end of the rainbow? A pot of gold. pot of gold. Right? Irish proverb. Go to the end of the rainbow and you will find a pot of gold. Here's what I want you to remember. Happiness lies not in the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but it lies in the satisfaction of knowing that you have a personal relationship with God, knowing that you, what you were created to do with your life, and knowing that you did it. You understand what I'm trying to say to you? Nothing can bring you a deeper seated satisfaction and sense of fulfillment is knowing that you were created intentionally. Knowing what you were created to do and dedicating your life doing that. 
Right now, at this point in my life, do you know what I think I was born to do? Be a pastor. And to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know that. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't know that. And knowing that, and knowing I was created to do it, and knowing that I'm doing it, brings me an enormous amount of satisfaction. That doesn't mean I'm happy with you every Sunday. But it brings me a great deal of satisfaction to know I was created to preach. I am preaching. And my life is not worthless because of that. What is your grandest hope this morning? What is your deepest desire? Jesus says again in Matthew 6, 19, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moss, moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there is your heart also. What is your treasure this morning? What is it that you most treasure in life? What is your grandest hope and dream? Is it hitting the power bar, bar power ball? Or is it knowing Jesus? Is it hitting the right number on the roulette wheel? Or knowing the purpose in your life? Is it having your team win this afternoon so you can win your bet? Or is it because you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? What is your treasure? You remember the parable of the talents that Jesus taught? He gave ten talents to one master was leaving for a long journey. He gave ten talents to one, five talents to another, and one talent to one. Keep that up there, please. That's great. And so the, the, ten, the guy who gave ten made ten more. The guy who gave five to made five four. The guy he gave one to buried it. Now imagine if, if the guy who, instead of burying it, he said, Lord, every day I bought a, 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 lot, a Powerball lottery ticket for you. Every single day I bought one, and the money's all gone. I didn't win. That was the master going to say. Suppose that you were created. Suppose that you were given life. And you were given life intentionally for a reason. And you pissed it away doing what you thought was important. And you stand before the Lord one day and you say, well, I, I, well, I, I. Because the purpose of life is not to chase money. It's not to chase status. It's to find Jesus Christ and have a relationship with God. Gamblers bet on money to make them happy. God wants us to bet on him. Gamblers depend on money for their happiness. God says, depend on me for your happiness. All right. You all know that not only did I go to seminary, I went to um, counseling school as well, to grad school. So I like to mix both worlds when I preach. I want to give you a very wonderful piece of advice from the secular world. This comes from my learning, my training at grad school. This is good stuff. And this is available on a handout as you walk out the door if you want to have it. Right? 17 ways, 17 things to do if you want to be happy. This actually is written, 17 things happy people do. All right? Number one, consume as little news as possible. This is true. This is true. From a psychological standpoint, what eats at your soul day after day? Well, it's going to be Trump. We're going to go to war. We're going to die. All right? That's a great way to be happy. Just keep listening to that all the time. Number two, spend no more than 30 minutes a day on social media. Number three, spend quality time with animals, particularly your own. Seriously. Number four, spend more time outside than inside. And those of you who are innocent, I apologize for this, but if you want to have, be happy, have physical relationship with your partner more than twice, more than once every seven to ten days, which is the average in America, it'll make you happy. We're designed to be together more frequently than that. Number six, go out of your way to hug and kiss and have skin-to-skin -skin contact as much as possible, but please do that with somebody that you know, not somebody that you Not somebody in prison, okay? I don't have time for this in prison. Number seven, drink coffee or hot tea and do so slowly. Why would drinking coffee or tea slowly make you happy? Anyone? Enjoy it. Everything slows down. You relax. Take your time. Number eight, work out at least two hours every week, three times a week, roughly 40 minutes per time. Number nine, go out of your way to find reasons to laugh. Do you ever wonder why I include laughter in the sermons? Is laughter a man-made thing or a God-given thing? And the cool thing about laughter is you have a, a, the way that our soul opens, it opens to music, it opens to tears, and it opens to laughter. And that's one of the reasons I use it. All right, number nine, plan and execute good deeds on a regular basis. Number 11, spend quality time thinking about spiritual matters. 
Number 12, have a positive outlook on life. Practice positive self-talk. Happy people encourage themselves more than they criticize themselves. Number 13, set written goals for each day and strive hard to achieve them. Number 14, wake up early and go to bed early. That can't possibly be right. It's got to be in this one. Right? Number six, fifth, six, 15, start each day with a healthy breakfast. Number 16, spend quality time each week with family and good friends other than your spouse. And number 17, live life with an attitude of gratitude. And those are great things. That's good advice, practical advice, solid advice. But the only thing is, that won't fill the hole in your soul. That won't satisfy you at the deepest level. There's only one thing that will fill the hole in your soul. Not, it's not church talk. It's not a myth. It's a fact of life. The only thing that will make you fully happy is Jesus Christ. Now, I know from doing this 20 years that more people remember my stories than remember my theological diatribes. So I'm going to tell you a story. True story. Most of them are. <clears throat> this one concerns a 40-year-old lady. I'm going to call her Viv. It's not her real name. Viv was not a morning person. <clears throat> she would begrudgingly get up early in the morning, but she knew that was the only time of the day she could claim as her own, and so she wanted to stay healthy. She wanted to be exercised, so she committed to getting up early to go to the local athletic club to swim laps in the pool. And she wouldn't have her coffee before she goes because she didn't want to have coffee in her stomach when she's swimming in the pool. So there was a little bit of edge to Viv every morning when she went to the club. <clears throat> All right. So she's down at the, the gym and she's in the locker room changing into her swimsuit. And she hears another lady in the room. And this lady's all bright and cheerful and happy. Oh! And Viv's like, <laughs> And she could not, she was annoyed by the other woman's cheerfulness. And she could tell, I mean, everything this woman said was all bright and chipper and cheerful and happy. And Viv was like, yeah, really bright. She heard the other woman say, oh, Dolores, I really appreciated the book you picked out for me last week. I know the library was out of your way, but I really appreciate the book. I just couldn't put it down. And then, um, oh, hey, um, hi, Pat, how are you this morning? Isn't this a beautiful day? You know, I walked over here today, and I saw two metal marks singing. Isn't it a beautiful day? Viv was getting angrier by the moment. You know, that voice is just too good to be true. Who can be that thankful and cheerful? I'll bet, that, I'll bet she's just some rich woman. She probably has a winter house and a summer house and servants to clean both of them. That's how, and she's just going to sit on the veranda all day and read books and drink tea. That's what Viv thought to herself. <laughs> well, she finished getting ready for the pool, and instead of going directly to the pool, she went around the corner of the lockers to see who this woman was, to have her assessment confirmed. And when she did, she saw a lady putting on a yellow housekeeping uniform. And it was a uniform that Viv was very familiar with because she saw it every single day when she went to the athletic club. This lady worked in the maintenance department. She, had, she picked up her plastic Walmart bag in which she had placed her wet swimsuit. She passed Viv as she went out the door and she said, I hope you see Jesus' love today. That made Viv a little more angry. She got into the pool and went swimming, finished her laps, went into the whirlpool to rest, to cool off, or to relax on the line. And there were two people sitting in the whirlpool. One was talking and one was not. The one that was talking was complaining about his arthritic knees, and he had sleepless nights, and he had a bad heart, and he had pain every time he got up, and the swimming pool was too cold, and the whirl to hot tub is too hot, and it's too long a distance to go from here to there, and every now and then he'd get his towel, and his diamond-covered hand would wipe off the sweat off his face, and then off he'd go again about how awful everything was. Viv guessed him to be in his 70s. Turned out he was the same age as the maintenance lady. Looked a lot older. It wasn't very difficult for Viv to figure out which was a Christian and which was not. And because of that, she decided she'd start going to church again. And she apologized to God for her anger at the cheerfulness of the other. Now, maybe it's hard to connect the dots and connect that story to gambling, but the issue is the issue of happiness. What makes you happy? 
One person who had Jesus, one person had money. Who was happy in the story? I came upon a poem this week that is the bumper sticker version of what I'm trying to teach this morning. And here's the poem. This is where we'll bring this to an end. There is never a day so dreary. There is never a night so long. But the soul that is trusting Jesus won't somehow, somewhere, find a song. Think about it. Think about it. On first glance, gambling may seem like an easy, harmless way to get money. But when we think about it, and think about it as a reason to be happy, it's not a good decision. I'm going to answer the question I started with directly. Is gambling wrong? The answer is yes, if you're gambling for money, and no, if you aren't. And that's the biblical, defensible answer. But gambling won't make you happy, because money won't make you happy. The only thing that will make you happy is Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Holy Father, I thank you for these words and for their truths. My prayer is that something that has been said will touch each heart in this room. It will change their life, deepen their understanding of you, draw you them into a deeper relationship with you, open their heart and mind to the possibility that you're really there. Perhaps change their attitude toward Powerball or towards the casino. But above all else, I pray, Father, your spirit will implant in each heart that happiness comes only from a relationship with you. Yes, there are practical steps that we can take, but it won't fill the hole in the soul. That only comes from knowing you. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen. We'll stand and sing one brief song, and then we'll go for the barn. I've never explained that. While the praise team tells, I'll explain that expression. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather, had a farm. And one summer I went, he and my, mother, my sister and I spent a week out there, and it was the week they dug potatoes. And he had a big old sledge and two horses, and we, did, we were out there digging potatoes and popping them on the sledge, and finally it was time to go home, go back to, to the barn, and I got on the sledge, and, we, and the horses just <coughs> bleh, bleh, bleh. About 500 feet from the barn, they took off running. And I said to Grandpa, what's the difference? What caused them to speed up? And he said, they smelled the barn. Meaning, the day is done. We're done. We're finished. We're heading for the barn. That's what I meant when I said that. Oh, if nothing else, you got a practical lesson. <laughs>
Thank you. 